and welcome back to RC Icons. So in this video, we want to delve into uh, an English company, <laughs> PB Racing. So I have a couple of PB kits in the collection. Um, both of them are spec to be built. We have the Mini Mustang, which is here with me today, which was their first car. Um, so PB Racing kind of a not a ton of information on the internet about them so they were really big into like pan car racing they did one eighth scale i believe they even built a one fifth scale um but they did three off road buggies um and the, the owner of pb racing uh was actually a design engineer who worked with uh cecil shoemaker at the very beginning and for whatever reason, the way the story goes is they couldn't see eye to eye on a design and they went their separate ways. So Keith, I got notes here, Playstead, Keith Playstead um, was working with Cecil and they couldn't come I come come to agreement on a, on a design. So Keith actually left um, Cecil and, or Cecil and, uh, decided to start his own company called PB Racing. Cecil went on to develop the cat. Keith designed the mini Mustang and uh, we all know what happened with the cat with uh, Masami Hirasaka uh, winning the world's title. I think it was 86 or 87. So PB did three different cars. They did the Mini Mustang, which was their first car. They offered this in two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive, although the two-wheel drive was the exact same car without the belt and without the front differential. The, I believe the front bulkhead was exactly the same, just without the dog bones slash differential slash belt. Um, and then... They ran the Mini Mustang for about a year, potentially two, um, tweaking it here and there along the way, and then uh, decided to rename it with all of the hop-ups that they had, had to offer at the time as the Maxima. So the Maxima got a new body shell, got a wing, I believe it got an under tray as well. One of them has an under tray, I think it might be the Maxima, but then it got got all of the upgrades so this has uh oil filled shocks gear diffs belt driven and then the maxima i believe may have gone to ball diffs um i may be wrong there but i believe it went to ball diffs and then it went i think it got the slipper clutch and i know at one point it went to uh an electric two speed um so i'm assuming it's a centrifugal clutch kind of deal but it did it did morph into a two speed car at, at one point as well not sure if that's in the Maxima or if that's in the Ace. So the third car they did and the one that I think they they made the least of, but it was the best car. So Mini Mustang, 86, 87, um, Maxima, 88, uh, and then the Ace in 89. And the Ace is, from a collector standpoint, that's the one, that's the one to have. Not that you don't see mini mustangs or maximas they are available here or there but aces you just do not come across them um they're extremely extremely hard to find we're hoping to add an ace at some point i'd love to have all three of them built in the collection um i did get this one in the maxima new in box from jason at true vintage so thank you jason um but the intention when i bought the kits was to build them so we're going to start that process today by getting this one built so let me bring the camera over real quick. We'll show you um, the kit as it stands. It is blister packed, so it does have a little bit of presentation, um, although it is a very small kit. I think PB was obviously in the uh, infant stages of their, of their production, and they're probably trying to keep costs down. I know whether it was a Mini Mustang, a Maxima, or an Ace, the box was the same, and it's just a sticker that changed. So, uh, you know, they were keeping costs down by not having three distinct boxes. In fact, no, that looks like it's the mini Mustang on the front, but 
I don't believe the Maxima picture is on the front. And the Ace, I know for sure, it doesn't have the picture of the car on the front. So they used kind of a generic box for all of the cars, uh, which a lot of companies did. AYK it did it the same. Um, and I get it. You know, you're trying to save money on illustration costs, on box costs. You buy one box for all the cars, throw the sticker on it, and you're good to go. So let me bring the camera over. We'll take a look at it real quick, and we'll break this thing open and start building it. PB Racing Mini Mustang. Again, that's just a sticker on the front of the box. They don't show you any pictures. It does have a sticker here. It tells you that it's a PB29 Mini Mustang four-wheel drive. Single speed. I think it might have been one of the first dual two-speed cars produced at the time. So when we take the cover of the box off, we have our manual. That was the PB1. That was the first car that they had put out. And again, it was a pan car. Typical manual of its day. Um, gives you a parts breakdown. It starts talking about if you have a two-wheel drive and you're, you're making up the front differential to make it a four-wheel drive it gives you a little bit of explanation there tips when assembling the axles and the wishbones and then it starts getting into assembly instructions so I'm not sure how helpful it's on differential assembly I'm assuming that that's it's gonna be a little bit tricky following the manual along but I'm sure we'll get through it just fine but it looks like it's gonna be a, a pretty cool build definitely more along like a manual for like a race car versus a, like a Tammy a character car so to speak no one-to-one -one diagrams or anything like that it's just very very um, simple. Hopefully that's what it's going to look like when she's all done. I actually like that look. Black with maybe like orange and yellow. It's hard because there's no real box art. I mean that's the box art there I guess. But I don't know that I want it to look like that. So let me get it. Oh let me show you the kit. So this is your kit presentation here. You've got your body here covering your chassis. You've got your parts breakdowns and then you got your wheels and tires on the other side. So wheels and tires are there. Chassis and body are there. And then just random parts bags. There's your main lower deck there. Uh, I'm assuming it was fiberglass. Bearing kit. Not sure what that is. Metal out drive cups, dog bones, drive pins. So yeah, let me uh, get the rest of this kit out. And uh, we'll get started on this. Looks like there's some uh, rubber bands here that are pretty well done. <laughs> All dry rotted. I wish to join the PB Owners Club and understand that membership is open to all model car enthusiasts. I understand that membership of the PB Owners Club entitles me to a copy of the PB Newsletter, which gives us useful information, racing tips, tuning ideas, and details of new PB products. That's cool. You think they'll let me join? <laughs> some reason, I don't think they're around anymore. So PB ran till about 2000, maybe the early 2000s before it finally shut down. 
like I said, they only did three off-road buggies, so the rest of them are like pan cars. And that's what you mostly see for sale on like eBay or in the vintage world today. So let me try to make some heads or tails of this and uh, we'll get started. That looks like a diff right there. There's your drive belt. Cool. It's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Single speed pack. Boy, I can't wait. Hopefully the Maxima is a two-speed because I really want a two-speed differential molding. Differential molding. So yeah, let's get started. Let me get this opened up. I'll see you back here in a second. Alright, so I got everything opened up. Um, the bags were labeled like miscellaneous parts bag. 10-1, 10-2, 10-3, Miscellaneous screw bag self tappers. Uh, kind of like a, more along the lines of like a Kyosho kit. And then as you get into the manual, um, what I've been doing is I'll read the whole side section first as I'm looking at the pictures and then I get a real good idea of kind of what you what I'm doing so it starts with me building the diffs so you've got your main diff gear with your three smaller gears um, it has me with the outdrive cups getting bearings and the bigger bevel gears put together and then it has me actually putting it all together with the diff screw and then um, the pulley in so I did one off camera 100% feels great um, yeah, it feels good. They did make a note in there not to over grease the diff so that grease would be splashing up on top of the belt pulley. So I greased the larger bevel gears and I greased the three main gears. And then essentially the way this gets put together. You can see all that excess grease coming out. So I'm just going to take my finger and pull that excess grease off. I'm going to throw it back on the other side. Real quick. Then it has me put my other... Uh, was that right? Yeah, that's right. Has me put my other side on. Make sure you work it around. And then you want to pull that excess grease off of both sides. Just to make sure that once it's all together, you don't have any grease coming up on top of the, the belt pulley itself. And then the actual diff nut says to lock tight, lock tight it, which is fine. I don't know what's going on here. That's the sign. The other thing it noted to do was to check these screws and make sure that they go in to the to the diff cup before you actually put it together make sure it threads in and out no problem so I did do that in the preparation portion so now the diff nuts in And then you take your other pulley cap and that's going to go in with three self tappers 2.6 by 5. The plastics are extremely hard like the screws go in 
but it is tight. So let's one screw in. screw so one thing that I noticed right away is your gears are obviously open on the outside it's not in an enclosed housing per se like we're used to usually you're making the diff and the diff is enclosed from the outside you can't see those bevel gears well obviously when it goes in the actual frame, at that point it's enclosed from elements on the outside. So that's step one. Or page two, that's that whole page. So now I'm gonna start doing page three, which is getting four steering arms slash uprights together with ball ends it looks like it has you cutting the threads for the ball ends with the out drives so that's the axle and it literally has you threading those with the axle as a tap before you even get started putting the things together which is totally different and then I'm assuming the this axle would be for like a two-wheel drive setup where I actually have four regular axles. So it says down here two-wheel drive and it's showing just a solid axle or four-wheel drive. It's showing four um, dog bone style um, axles. So I'm going to keep pressing on here and moving forward, just kind of figuring this out as I go. The belt has a very unique setup where it comes up and then drops back down. So I will bring you along for the ride as much as possible because I'm sure there's not too many people that are watching that have built a PB uh, Mini Mustang before. So it's going to be cool for both of us or all of us. So let me build up these four and I'll bring you back. Then we'll start getting into putting it into that housing with the belt. And we'll just keep pushing forward uh, little by little. Alright, so it's actually been a couple of hours. And I'm, I think, two pages further. So on page three, it had me make the four, what do they call them? Axle blocks? Axle blocks is what they call them. So take an axle block, you put, uh, it's like a six millimeter ball end in either side. You don't have to tap it. I was showing you how it tells you to use a wheel axle to tap it. That's only if you don't have a nut driver. If you have a nut, if you had to turn it by hand, you would, you would tap the hole first with the axle. I did try it. It was a bit fiddly, um, just to, for the experience, but basically you put, the I think there's six millimeter ball ends on either side of all four and then you put an inner bearing the axle runs through then you put your outer bearing on and then it has you put the drive pins in so the drive pins I don't know that the pin is tapered or if the hole is tapered on the axle but it starts off real easy and then it gets harder as you get to the center of where it needs to be positioned three of them weren't really a problem the fourth one fought me a bit I had to use channel locks, I used needle nose pliers, finally got it centered. Um, and then you put the wheel adapters on, and when everything is in place, it's on there. Like, it, there's no movement at all, and, and it feels great, like, nothing wrong with it. And then it had you put, um, 
they call them four millimeter ball ends. I saw one to run down. Four millimeter ball ends on all four. They're calling them steering balls. Now I didn't think I didn't think that this was uh, four wheel steer, but maybe it is because it's got me putting steering balls, um, steering ball ends on all four of them. So obviously two are for the front, two are for the rear. And I don't know why you would have steering links in the rear unless you were doing rear steer. There's only room for one servo. So I got all of that built. And it takes a bit to kind of read through their directions and figure out exactly what the hell they're saying. So page four shows all four of those built at the top. No big deal. That last step was getting the steering balls in. Then it has me get the, the, the center chassis gearbox assembly and you have to get your servo in place first now there's no holes for the servo screws so i drilled two millimeter holes once i figured out which way it needed to go um, and then i used three millimeter self tappers but you also have to channel out a section for the servo wire to come back out the servo wire just drop something the servo wire is not supposed to come through this side so you have to cut a channel in that chassis enough to get the wire back out this side and it actually shows you in the picture here so the chassis plates here show holes in a channel channel on both sides um, but it shows the holes none of that is done so you have to fabricate all of that yourself you have to cut the channel drill the holes and then they don't supply hardware for the servo, the servo screws. You need to supply that. So once you get it in place, it shows the wire again coming out the far side, not the back side. So that's how I've got it set up. Then it has you make this drive gear pulley slash belt tensioner piece. So all plastic pieces, two plastic bushes with a center section. You grease that up, slam it together. It slides into this piece with a pin that rolls in between and then the drive pulley goes up inside of that as well so the drive pulley I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this on camera but the drive pulley is essentially right there and then the other piece is down in there so when you take right now the drive pulley is not extended but when you pull it in you can see it tensioning the belt so once that's assembled on the left hand side you have to get your drive belt with your diffs get those set into the car and routed correctly hold all that in place this is the two wheel drive version because that was throwing me off i'm like why is there one picture with a belt like this and one with a belt like this again the two wheel drive like i said in the intro same everything just didn't have the front diff right so smaller belt no diff two-wheel drive car longer belt diff four-wheel drive car so you end up getting your belt stretched out this is not even showing the servo in although it should because you just put it in back here um and then you get the right hand side snapped in and screwed together with uh six screws so that process was about two hours so now i'm getting into page six here where it's going to have me start getting the motor plate the motor plate assembly together and getting that attached to the car and then it starts showing me the lay shaft and the orientation of it with all the dimensions almost like a design drawing so what do i think of the build so far um this is definitely not a kit I, now, granted, this is 1987, 86. Not a kit for the novice back then, and not a kit for the novice now. So, this is an extremely, extremely difficult kit to put together. Um, you really, have, you really have to be paying attention to what you're doing, and. Uh, and be reading through and understanding the process before you go in to do it. It's not like a Tamiya kit where everything is laid out step by step, nice and easy for you to follow through. 
I would say Kyosho kits are a little bit harder than a Tamiya kit to put together. Shoemaker kits are are harder than even a Kyosho kit. I would say this is harder than even a Shoemaker kit. Um, to be able to understand the directions and apply it to what it is that you're doing. It's very, very technical and very, very difficult. Nothing, half of the stuff that you're doing is based off of... Uh, written direction with no picture to reference at all so it's telling you to do all of this stuff and it gives you a little picture but it's not like you can see it from three different angles to see exactly what it is that you're doing so you're trying to read through decipher with whatever diagram you might have to figure it out but then it's it starts it throws you for a loop it's telling you to mount the servo and then the next pictures have no servo um, so you're always, you're constantly questioning what it is you're doing. Cool as hell. This is absolutely a race car, no doubt about it. This was not like a comical car. This, this was, uh, this was a very high end engineered car. Now that doesn't mean it was good. Um, it just means that it was a very high end and engineered car. Um, I'm, I'm having fun with it, but it's it, it feels more uh, like work than uh, just kind of going through the motions. So, very technical. Um, so, I'm going to keep moving forward here. It's got me excited about the Maxima. I'm hoping the Maxima has the two-speed, because I'll be honest. It's like I can't imagine working through the process of getting a two-speed put together. Um, so, it does have me excited for the future build, but I'm going to keep... Pushing maybe the maximum will be easy after I'm done this one. I'm not sure, but I'm gonna keep pushing forward here, and uh, and do my normal routine, bringing you back when when I have time, and when I think I've got something to show you. It's very hard to show you step by step because there's just a lot going on with small sections of parts like this. That's a lot. There's a lot going on just with this part, you know, and it took. I don't know, an hour, over an hour to put that together, all four of them together. Um, mainly because of the drive pins, but very cool. Loving it. See you in a second. All right, so I figured I'd bring you back. Where am I at? I only did two pages, but I figured I would show you anyways. So first it has us take the motor plate out. You got to put two pins for the gear cover in place. Um, it's a three millimeter threaded on one side, and then it's just solid pin for a body pin. You put a nut on the inside, run it through the motor plate, nut on the outside. So I did that. That's these here. One on the top, one on the bottom. Then I had you screw the motor plate on with four screws. Done deal. Then it gets you into the laydown shaft that holds the spur gear on. So it tells you to get the right hand side of the laydown shaft and it gives you all the dimensions of it with the notches. The only problem is the one in my kit was way smaller, shorter, and it only had three notches total, not five. I'm assuming this one is for the two speed, um, but they don't give you a picture of the single speed. So as you read through the directions, it basically tells you to get the laydown shaft. You put a bearing in the on this side in the in the chassis. There's a bearing retainer that goes in the motor plate. In fact, it shows it in this picture here. So right here, there's a bearing retainer. There's a bearing on the other side. So what I did was I took the laydown shaft and I just held it over the chassis and I could see that one notch lined up with the pulley, the belt pulley, another one lined up with the outside end of the chassis, and then the last one was on the outside edge of the motor plate. So between looking at the pictures and reading through, I figured out that the belt pulley gets put on first with the three millimeter um, jam jam screw or uh, set screw. Then it tells you to put a three millimeter screw in the front here. Basically what that's doing is that's pushing on the belt tensioner and it's tensioning that belt. 
So if I tighten it up, it puts more tension on the belt. If I loosen it, it slackens the belt. So I got the belt tight. You can see it moving in there. You can see the out drives moving. Not too tight, but tight enough. Then it tells you to put the gear retainer, which is an, an alloy piece on the inside here. There's a spacer, then that goes on, then the gear goes on. The gear retainer has uh, three holes in it, and the spur gear has three pins that set into those holes. And then there's a C-clip, like an actual automotive C-clip that holds that in place. Then there's a retainer on this side with a with a set screw that goes into the last notch on this side. So I got the spur gear is in place. Everything feels great. Although the directions weren't the best um, for that part of it. But having built a million kits, it was easy enough for me to kind of figure it out. So at this point, it's going to have me start getting into the wishbones. Although it looks like I'm going to be doing some fabrication here because it's showing... It's showing, uh, it shows him reaming out the ends of the actual uh, hinge pins with a utility knife. And then it also shows, shows him doing something with the, looks like the hinge pin um, mount is in a vise. So I don't know, I don't know what that's about, but I'll read through the directions here and figure it out. Looks like the hinge pins are held in with a set screw, um, like a lot of cars. So you're going to build up all four arms with the actual mounts. And then it looks like it those mounts get mounted to the center chassis on all four corners. And I'm assuming that's your top arms. And then it has you, looks like the lower arms just get pinned into place. Then it looks like it's it's getting your anti-sway bar in in the back. And then finally we'll be mounting our chassis plate. So I'm going to keep moving forward here. And uh, I'll see you in a second with some kind of progress. Alright. So it had me make the upper arms with the mounting points. You actually have to... The center of the mounting point is solid. So... You have to get it halfway down and then you actually hammer it through. <laughs> hammer it through to get to where it's centered. And then you have to put a set screw in the middle to hold it in place. Those set screws did not come. I don't have them in my hardware. So I'm not sure. I looked in the other bags. I didn't see them in there either. Don't know. I have set screws. So I just, I just used some of my own that were the same size. Um... So that's essentially making these four here, and then it has you mount them to the to the chassis box or plate with four screws, two in each arm. And then the tapered part needs to face back, straight arm section faces forward. And then you make the lower arms just slide the pin through, and when you put them on, the, this notch needs to be facing forward. And those actually snap into the bottom of the chassis. So I put the upper arms on with the bolts or with the screws. They're just self-tappers. Good to go. The lower ones, you can see if I pull one out. So that's it when you make it. And then you can see there's a groove in that chassis. So it just literally just snaps in. nice and free so when the when the chassis plate comes down it's going to sandwich over that then it had you put the rear anti-roll bar in on into the arms and then that slides into a groove as well so now the next step is actually mounting the fiberglass plate so it tells you to to get the screws started but not to tighten them all the way so I actually have the screws here. I literally have every tool in my arsenal out right now. 
I've been used a hammer. I've used a drill. I've used uh, seat clamp pliers. Um, channel locks. It's like you name it. I've used it on this build. It, but it's a cool build. It's just so different. Um, so different than anything that I've ever put together. Let's see if I can do this here. Oh, being on camera is always fiddly and then one thing I'm surprised about now PB I thought was a UK based company back in the day but most of their hardware is standard so these are number four by five sixteenth self tapper and that's been the case with a lot of the hardware whereas usually stuff even vintage stuff from the UK, it's going to be a, a metric hardware. So just different. I'm trying not to tighten on his 12 screws here. I'm trying not to tighten them too much because it says to, to mount it loose. Plastic so far have actually been really nice and strong, even being from 1986. Um, haven't had any real issues as far as um, the plastics wanting to crack, split, break, and or screw stripping. The screws just stop when they stop. You know, it's it's been. Uh, it's been a pleasant surprise to be honest because you never know with a vintage kit start putting it together and the plastics are brittle I have actually researched quite a bit online how to rehydrate old plastics just because I've got so many vintage kits to build you're bound to run into it at some point where you get a kit where the plastics are just really really brittle Try switching screwdrivers to a smaller head here, see if that works better. So this little chassis plate does not cover the lower arms. I'm assuming it's going to be a bumper or something of some sort that locks the lower arms into place. We got three more to go here. So uh, let me wrap this up real quick, and uh, and I'll bring you back in the next section. It's got us making some arms here, getting the front um, anti-sway bar in. So I'll see you in a second. All right, starting to look like a car. So it had me put the chassis plate on. That was the last segment I showed you. It just cautions you not to over tighten. Then it had me put the bumper bracket on, which holds the front arms on. Um, then it had me slide the front anti roll bar on, which sits underneath the bumper, and then three more screws to hold that in place. So at this point, both front and rear anti sway bars are on, bottom of the chassis is on front bumpers on so it's starting to look like a rig here um, getting excited so let me see here should I remove from the runner the flash four drive shaft retainers eight track rod end moldings and four anti-roll bar link moldings 
place the track rod ends. So I'll have to read through here and figure out what's next, but it looks like it's going to have me start making the bell crank. Front and rear track rod steering linkages servo saver. So it's going to have me start making, looks like track rods. Um, it must have adjustable camber in and out somehow with some of these rods. But it's got me making rods and it's got me putting the bell crank together. Coming up, there's your steering bell crank here. Uh, oh, maybe I screwed that up. Yeah, I screwed that up. So I put the anti-sway bars into the arms and there's actually a sway bar rod track rod that it's supposed to go on to that gets screwed into those holes so i'm gonna have to backtrack a little bit but that's what happens the directions really didn't make it clear it shows here it shows it in and it looks like they're going into those arms and they're actually not going into the arms they're just it's just positioned there and then same here you can see it in this picture it's on top of the arm um, and I had put it into that hole. So I'm going to have to backtrack a little bit, but no big deal. But I'll bring you back. I'm just excited that it's starting to look like a car. Cool, cool. See you in a second with a fixed anti-sway bar. <laughs> uh, too funny. Hopefully some bell cranks and everything else. Alright, so it's a new day. I fixed... The anti-sway bars, I got them on their brackets, whereas in the last clip they were actually in the holes of the arms that the screws were supposed to go in. So those are all set. And then the next step, I feel like I've done a ton, but I really only did three pages. So it had me make up um, four tie rods or tie arms the two smaller ones are for the steering and the rear ones are, are um, track rods essentially then it had me make up the servo saver which is two um, v-shaped arms that slide into each other with um, an aluminum shaft spring and nut so that was easy enough to put together and then it had me pre-assemble the bell crank. Although I don't know why it had you do it. Because you have to completely take it apart again to get it in the car. So right here there's an arm, a bridge uh, arm that attaches the two. And then that's your steering arm there. And then your idler arm. And then right here it shows the idler arm getting attached to the chassis with a tapered screw. And then the servo saver on the other side. So... Essentially, what you end up with is this is your idler arm here. It's just going with a self-tapper, not a self-tapper, a tapered head. And then the arm passes through the chassis. It's kind of nice that these just are free-floating. But it just passes through the chassis to the servo saver that's over here. And then that will get attached to the servo. And then it had me put the two smaller arms. Now they are kind of tight. They need to wear in. Um, but the two steering arms are on. And then it had me put in two ball ends in the back of the chassis for the rear trailing arms. I think that's what they're calling them. So essentially in the back you've got upper arm, lower arm, trailing arm. And then in the front... It's upper arm, lower arm, steering arm. So all four are the same, which is unique. You don't see that every day. So now that that's done, we're moving on to, we have to actually make our dog bones. So it's a plastic dog bone. And then it basically just gives you a drive pin to slide through them. thought it was a little bit weird that they weren't metal but 
Maybe they want them to be able to flex. I don't know. It'd be interesting to see how the Maxima is, because obviously it was a progression. The changes they made in the Mini Mustang, right, became uh, standard business in the Maxima. So maybe they went to metal. Maybe they went to UJs. Who knows? So, again, it's just a plastic arm, and you're just taking drive pins and sliding them through to make the dog bone itself. Now, I've built a lot of kits in my day. Never had to put my drive shafts together like that before. So, new one to me. But that's kind of how this kit is. It's just different, very different. Not necessarily hard, um just different there's like nothing that I've done on this car is like any other car I've worked on not to say that there aren't others out there like it um, I just think it's cool that PB essentially made three cars three off-road cars in the company's history and we've got two out of the three here hopefully we'll add the third someday but it's a really rare car it's not easy to find an ace so those are the four drive shafts made up. And now we've got drive shaft retainers. So these are going to get screwed in somewhere. It must be right there on the lower arm. It's the only spot for one. And then the drive shaft basically sits inside of that retainer. So that's a new one as well. I've never seen a car that's got retainers like that. So essentially the arm goes in and it sits in this retainer and the retainer gets screwed to the bottom bottom arm. So another another little something different. So uh, <laughs> these pictures are funny. Shows you clamping the 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 uh, axle ends with a vise. Putting it in a vise with the upper arm and lower arm lined up and using a vise to snap them together. <laughs> it's just, I don't know, it's just stuff you don't, you don't see every day. It's like manhandling a car. So in this picture here, you can see that drive shaft support. So I'm going to continue on here and, uh... We're almost to the shocks, which is essentially the last piece of the puzzle, other than uh, the battery bracket. We have shocks, then we have the battery bracket, electrics, wheels and tires. So we're almost there. I'll see you in a second, most likely with a finished car. Or maybe we'll have wheels and tires left to do. But we'll see you in a second. So I've got... I've got three of the four shock bodies made, but I wanted to do the fourth on camera. So, in preparation, it has you make the piston. So you have your piston rod with an E-clip on either side of the actual two-hole piston. And then you've got the metal, there's a metal retainer. It goes on a little bit tight, but it's got a groove in it on the top. And then there's a groove for an O-ring to go in. And then there's a plastic sleeve that goes on. And then there's a silicone O-ring that goes up inside this side of it. You can see it's white. So that makes the shock top. So now... You take, this is a rear shock body, and you can see there's a bleed screw in it. So right now the bleed screw is in, in all the way in place. So you fill the shock body up with oil. I'm just using Tamiya Soft, because it's what I have on hand. And the car is not a heavy car, so I don't think it's going to need anything more. But it says to within 7.5 millimeters of the top, take your rod and you put it in just far enough for that o-ring to seat inside of there and you can see there's four holes 
these are going to be capture or yeah capture holes so there's four holes in that body i don't know if you can see it there's one right there so now i'm going to push the piston down and i do it slowly so that the oil can actually get through those that two hole piston and as you push down any excess oil starts coming out of those holes you can see it starting to drip out take a rag clean that oil off it's just a very different way to build a shock and I don't know shocks fascinate me so whenever I come to the last one I always want to try to film it if I think it's something you haven't seen now I'm gonna undo the bleeder screw I'm not going to take it out. I'm just going to undo it partially so you can see it's sticking out now. The next step is to actually drive this top into the body. It fits tight, like really tight. And then any excess oil is going to come out the bleeder hole screw. So as I push down on the shock top, it's driving oil out of that bleeder screw. And now it gives me two little roll pins. And you go through these holes in the shock body. So one on this side, one on this side, and it's sitting in that top groove. You had the O-ring groove that the O-ring was sitting in, and then you had that secondary groove. Well, that secondary groove is for these pins to slide through, and that's what holds that shock cap in place with the body. So now those pins are in. Now this body can't come out. Those pins are holding it in place. Now you tighten your bleeder screw. wipe off all of your excess oil now I built the other three it's my son's birthday today so I built the other three and I had to go downstairs and do stuff for his birthday which is fine um, but I was concerned about leaking or what have you so I came back up a few hours later and no oil anywhere so they're nice and sealed so now I'm just cleaning the hole in the shock body here with a pick tool getting the last of the oil out and that's it i've got four shock bodies with pistons inserted ready to go so the next step will be uh getting the attachment in place with the springs So it looks like there's an it's a two it's a two piece shock bottom and then there's a collar as well but then we're going to get into putting the uprights on and uh and mounting those springs so I'm just going to do that and then uh, I'll probably just bring you back with a finished car at this point because all that's left is mounting the shocks on the uprights getting the battery brackets in place and then, uh, and then putting the wheels and tires on. So, I'll, like I said, I'll probably just bring you back with a finished rig. So, I'll see you in a second here. Well, you can see a finished car or a chassis. Boy, the last part, doing the battery bracket, that was interesting. It was uh, definitely fiddly. So, that's your battery bracket there. But check this out push on this button on the top and the bracket comes off it's basically uh, it's a two spring catchment system and I've got it a little bit tight right now so I have to pull up on it with pliers there's two springs in here that are basically sitting down flat and when the pins go in it catches those two springs so the intention is, you take your NICAD, you take your bracket, 
you fit your NICAD in there and you set your bracket where you want it and you tighten it down and the bracket stays on the battery. They give you uh, they give you two brackets so that you can do two batteries. And essentially when you're racing to put your battery in, you literally just slide it through the hole and you just snap it in place. Done. It's in. And then when you want to change your battery, you push down. I think you're supposed to glue the spring in. But you push down, that battery slides out. You grab your second one with your second battery already on it. And you just snap it in. Done. Locked in. Cool as hell. Uh, 1986, right? Quick changing battery. Who would have thought? And then it's got uh, it's got soldering posts on the battery bracket. I'm assuming that would be your leads. Your battery would solder to that, and that would be your you know would have a plug on it right here to plug in. I don't know why you'd have soldering leads on there, but because you'd think that you would just plug the battery straight in. But who knows? Both of them they give you soldering leads for both of them. So definitely odd. Um, very different, but cool. I like different. I think it's cool. It's just cool as hell. So that's your car. You get your body mount. It acts as a brace as well. Now, I was talking to Jason at True Vintage. So he saw the community post. Diffs feel good. Um, everything's just a little, little bit tight. Needs a battery. Run through it. But feels great. Belt feels great. So I was talking to Jason at True Vintage. So he saw the community post where I started building the car. And it, it prompted him to take a couple of his down. Because he's got a couple of them. That are essentially race cars. Um, he's, got them, he's got them specced for racing. And... Uh, and rebuild them and get them out, right? So we were talking about option parts and stuff and how... I'm not... Rem I can't remember if it was... Uh, JG may have done a shock tower front and rear um, and somebody else. But there's a lot of flex in these plastics. And I was telling them how I had to pop one of the arms off to put... There's little silicone shims in, in the... Uh, and the dog bones to take up the play and I had forgot to put them in so I had to pop them off and I literally had these arms bent almost 90 degrees from the pin angle the plastics are so flexible so so like I I was researching they they've got to be all nylon but I was researching how to rehydrate plastics vintage plastics because I thought when I got into you know one of these or one of the other kits that at some point I was going to have to uh rehydrate some plastics and i thought this might be one of those kits and uh definitely not um so super super flexible the plastics but not brittle you know what i mean and sturdy absolutely sturdy so the thing feels great damp ends does what it's supposed to do um just a all around cool car so so different from anything that i've ever built so different like nothing comes close N not necessarily in quality although i will say that this it feels like a really quality car um more so in the uh just the design and the way everything goes together it's so different than anything i've ever built i've built mids i've built lasers i've built uh, Tamiya, you know, Dynastorm, um, you name it, uh, Egress, Evolution, you name the cars that I've built, RC10, uh, World's Car, everything, this thing is so different from anything else, just unbelievably different. The way that the arms work, pillow ball, almost like the Hot Shot, um, it's got pillow ball, essentially, arms, front and rear um but just in a completely different way what a cool build um my mind is blown to be honest
and it makes me want to dive straight into the Maxima. But I don't, I can't, I got to relish that one. Now that I've done this one, I, I you know, I definitely want to dive into it, but I, I don't, then it's over. You know what I mean? It's done. So, uh, so yeah, we'll be waiting on that one for a little while just because of how cool this thing was. Unbelievable. What a car. What a car. I wish I had the two speed for it. Um, and I, and he was telling me that the two speed did not come standard in the Maxima. So that, that wish is blown. Um, it is what it is. So the tires are dynamite racing tires on there. Um, if you were curious, um, so that's it. The rest is body and decals. And because it's a race car, it shows a body, no decal layout, and it doesn't show a livery for the body. It's just, you know, I love the look of this one. I may do that with black, orange, and yellow. And then I think with the white, with the red wheels, that, that just look killer. Um, but yeah, we'll have to see. That's for the next video. So yeah, let me clean up my mess. I mean, as far as the build, build goes, I can't say enough about it. Just awesome, awesome build. What a cool build. I wish there was more of them around. I really do. Um, but it's rare for a reason. So yeah, let me clean up my mess here and I'll bring you back for a closing. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. That was an absolutely amazing build. Um, to be quite honest with you, I've built a lot of cars. I've built a lot of rare cars, um, special cars. Um, I'm, I'm privileged in having the collection that I have that I get to build, uh, stuff like this. And I'll be honest out of everything that I've built, um, to date on a channel, this is absolutely in the top three. Um, no doubt about it. What a car. And just, just an absolute awesome, awesome build. You know, I was talking with Jason over at True Vintage. I got the kit from him, and uh, I was sending him pictures of the build. And he's like, "You, you, you, you lit a fire in me to get mine out and rebuild them." So he's actually working on a video now. It may already be on his channel by the time you guys see this, because Jason has a tendency to um, produce content in real time. Whereas I structure my content twice a week and I have to film weeks in advance. So you guys will see this essentially four weeks after it actually happened. It's, it's just a way I have to run my channel because of my family life and my business. Um, otherwise, the channel would just be too sporadic and, and it wouldn't be good for you guys. And so for me, it works. Um, so unfortunately, you guys don't see this stuff in real time. Which is hard because a lot of times in comments you guys will give me ideas on how to do things and I've, I, it's already done. Like it's, <laughs> it's just the way it goes, you know. But it doesn't, don't let that sway you because it's uh, an idea that I might be able to use on a next build or a future build. Um, but a lot of times, you know, it's like, oh, you can dye the wheels. And it's like, well, I, I, I actually, I did dye them three weeks ago, you know. <laughs> so I get it. Um, but, yeah, so this thing was absolutely awesome. And when I was talking to Jason, I was like, I was actually researching because I was worried. Um, I hadn't really looked at the kit. I hadn't really felt the plastics at all. But knowing it was from 1986 and dealing with some of the Tamiya kits, like my Super Saber that just shattered... Uh, under its own weight, I was I was researching like how to rehydrate plastics, um, vintage plastics, right? How do how do you take uh, vintage plastics that are brittle and and rehydrate them to the point to where they're flexible again before you even start a build um, like this? So if I break an arm, I'm not finding that arm. It might take months, you know. Um, brings me to another point. I'm actually bidding on another car um that has a bunch of new parts with it currently and uh hopefully it'll work out martin harrow is in the uk and martin if you haven't checked his hip channel out um uh, martin hrc i believe that's the name and i'm sorry if it's wrong but a lot of you guys know martin from the comments martin is just an awesome guy and uh i reached out to our martin because it's on ebay uk listen if i buy this thing can you be the middleman for me and he's like yeah absolutely I'm literally buying it just for parts, although I don't know that I'll need them. Um, so 
I was when I was talking with Jason, I was like, I had to. So when you put the drive shafts in, there's that little piece of blue silicone tubing that's supposed to go in there and act as a shim. In the Tamiya, it's like the pink urethane bushing. Um, in this, it's like a piece of blue silicone tubing that you cut to four millimeters, stick it in there, and it takes the drive shaft play out. Well, when I put the drive shafts in, there was quite a bit of play in there. So I was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to take this apart and make sure that I put those in there just to get the play out. So I had to pop the arms off of the pillow balls and literally there was so much flex in the plastic that I had this arm almost 90 degrees from the hinge pin before it popped off. And I was so worried that it was going to break, but it didn't. So the plastics are amazingly flexible yet durable. It's not like the car is flip floppy around because the plastics aren't um, structurally um, solid. They are, but there's so much flex in them. There must be a ton of nylon in this. It's not like a, a, a Delrin or something like that where it's a real hard, hard plastic. It's super, super soft, but at the same time, um, structurally sound. And I was amazed by it. Um, so yeah, this car, I don't know. It just intrigues the hell out of me. So I'm really looking forward to building the Maxima. I really, really want to get my hands on an Ace, although that remains to be seen. Jason will probably help me with that too, although I don't want to lean on Jason for everything. Um, you know, he's got his collection and I don't want to be the guy that's always trying to get something out of him. He is trying to help me source a two-speed for this which is absolutely epic i told him you know don't do it on my account at the same time i'm never going to find it anywhere else so if i get it great but no pressure you know um so yeah the build was just amazing uh i hope it came across on camera how amazing the build really is I don't know how these did racing. I, I, I've heard from some people that they absolutely destroyed everything on the straights when the two-speed was in. I also heard from people that because of that, the two-speed was banned um, and wasn't allowed to you be used in a lot of race clubs. So um, the car um, would not... It was not a leading car when you were in the bends and in the turns. But if you got into a long straight, the car would rocket ahead of everybody else. And then it would lose its position again as soon as you got into the turns. That's what I heard. I know nothing. I never run one. I don't know. But to, the two-speed stuff intrigues the hell out of me. I'm trying to source all the parts from my Kyosho TF3 two-speed. Um... I really want to see how that works and how it reacts when you're driving it. And the same with this. Uh, I, I really don't want to drive this car. The car I'm bidding on would be like a driver car, but also a parts car in case anything happened if I did drive this. Um, so it's, it's nice to be able to have parts. And when you're dealing with a rare, rare car like this, I mean, it's it looks like it's a complete chassis. Plus, it's got a couple of sets of brand new arms. It's got shock parts it's you know it's got various parts um and that's half the battle yeah you can have parts made i'm working on having the exotech eight millimeter extension made um for the trf 201 right now my brother-in-law i got it being 3d modeled uh it's being scanned and then he's gonna see and see it i want to try to get my friend martin in switzerland to, he wants three or four of them um but once i have the cnc files i can make I can make them for anybody that's interested, right? You can't find that anymore. Uh, Exotech isn't making it anymore. So, yeah, you can make parts, but it, there's definitely a process to it. There's a lot involved. So, and I don't want to have to do that. Um, if I have an extra parts car or I, or potentially a runner car, um, that's awesome. So, hopefully this will work out with, with Martin in the UK and the eBay UK uh, car that's for sale. Hopefully I can land that. Um, but yeah, I, I really hope you guys enjoyed it. It was absolutely awesome. I can't say enough about the build. You'll have to make sure that you tune in for the second video where we actually get the body done. And then maybe a third video. I don't know if we'll get this one running or it'll be the other car. If I win it, maybe we get that one running. Um, but yeah, there's definitely more content coming for sure on the channel. So 
I would ask you to consider subscribing if you're not subscribed, if you're not already subscribed, and make sure you turn on your notifications so that if this did intrigue you, you don't miss us getting the body done, but also potentially getting a two-speed on it and giving this thing a rip, uh, whether it's this one or the other one, you know, same chassis, same car, essentially. Um, but yeah, I would, I would encourage you to do that. And then let me know in the comments what you think of the PB cars. Have you heard of the PB cars? A lot of people haven't. Did you have one if you were in the UK? They were big in the UK. A lot of you UK boys know the PB cars. Did you have one? I know Glenn had a Maxima um, at one point when he was growing up. So they were pretty common over there. I knew nothing about them here in the US. Never heard of them. Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. So cool as hell. Um, yeah, let me know in the comments. If you liked the video, thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs down. It's okay. Um, doesn't bother me. <sighs> Sorry, it's a mouthful. Till next time, we'll see you soon. Thanks.